All right, everybody. Good afternoon. If you're uh, if you're here for lunch, it's back there. But if you're here and you want to talk about innovation at scale, you're in the right place. I'm Ed Glassman, and sorry for a few technical difficulties. Wanted to get a little bit of audio. And you know, if somebody gives you the choice and says you can have audio or you can have video, you should say I want both. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about innovation at scale. And I know that talking about innovation at Northside is kind of like you know talking to the kings and queens of innovation. But I have a little bit of a different story to tell you. And it's a story that I've been living through for a long time about trying to do innovation at really large companies running at scale around the world. So I just want to share with you a few of those stories and hopefully we can have an interesting conversation about it. My job today is that I lead what's called the commercial business for MasterCard. Um, and most people know the brand MasterCard, but they don't really know sort of what MasterCard does on a day-to-day -day basis. So I just want to play you a short clip that gives you a little bit of an idea about uh, who we are as <laughs> Trying 
to find ways to continue to innovate in and amidst that complexity can be a challenge. So I wanted to just talk about three different places uh, that I've spent some time, which is technology, pharma, and financial services, and share some observations about innovation, sort of how did it get done. So um, the first one is technology. Probably technology is the, is the place that if you ask people what's innovation all about and where's it happening, they'd say, oh my god, you know, it's in the technology space, it's in my pocket. And that's true, but there's also some really very fundamental things that happen um, in large tech companies. I, I used to work at a very large tech company, and I worked in the uh, research division there. And I did um, really basic stuff. I worked on um, submicron robotics, you know, trying to build robots that move at sort of uh, uh, the sort of the, the, the size of um, wavelength of light. And the guys down the hall from me were doing that stuff too, but they were a lot better at it. They actually invented a thing called the scanning tunneling microscope. And you might never have heard of that, but they won the Nobel Prize for that. That was a really cool thing that allowed you to actually take pictures of atoms and see how they were laid out. Um, we all played around with that and thought it was really cool stuff. Um, and people figured out actually that not only could you take pictures of where an individual atom was, but you could actually pick them up and move them around. And then, you know, we were working late at night and people had interesting ideas and they said, well, you could actually start to do things like paint pictures or create little artworks and things like that out of individual atoms. Now, that's a really cool idea. When you see the pictures of it, they're remarkable, but it's really hard to actually go make any money out of that stuff. So at the time, we didn't really have any concept of what are you going to do with that. But it was really, truly, and is remarkable stuff. But if you look at what that led to, that was innovation that subsequently <coughs> led to some interesting things. So the first one was doing, the obvious one was like, go do semiconductor repair really cool big problem is you make a bunch of batch of chips and a whole bunch of them fail and that yield the it's sort of what you get out of the car in makes them really expensive. So you can actually go back and fix them and fix imagine a wire that's a line that's like you know one hundred thousand the width of your hair. Go back and fix that. That's a, an interesting technique. So semiconductor repair was one 3D printing only, instead of doing it like, you know, there's people that do it now and can really like, you know, print interesting things like jet engine parts at your desk. But you could print individual things at the atomic level with this stuff. Um, and it's actually now being used in a way to do um, capsules for nanoengineering for um, custom drug delivery. So really wild stuff that at the time, if you said, what am I going to do with this particular piece of innovative technology, you would have never have said, or at least we never said any of those things. Um, later on, I went to work in uh, pharmaceuticals. And um, this is a crash course in pharmaceuticals. So you start out with a whole bunch of ideas, and you have thousands and thousands of molecules that you're trying to develop and test. And you spend a little bit of money on each one. And as you move them through the process and you think they're good, you go through planning and research and development and testing with the goal of making a particular drug that you're going to bring to market. And as you move left to right, you spend lots more money. So you might spend $10,000 on a molecule on the left. By the time you get here and you're actually testing at scale, you might spend $500 million on that. So big risk, big return, and lots of planning and process and stuff that you wrap around that to be good at that. Lots of innovation and technology all along the way. But there was this interesting thing that happened, which is sometimes you fail. And when you fail back there, it's OK. But if you fail late, so if you fail early, it's OK. It doesn't really cost you much in terms of time or money or energy. But if you fail late, it's really expensive. So you try to avoid that. And the more that you do try to avoid that, the more rigorous and dialed in and focused you get, you kind of lose the surroundings. And that's one of the things that we found about innovation at scale is that sometimes really unexpected things happen that can produce remarkable results that you never planned on. Um, I was involved in one where uh, people were testing a heart medication. And it turned out to be a mediocre heart medication. And there's tons of heart medications out there that are really good. So if you want to bring out a new one, you really have to be much better than the competition. And, this one wasn't, and so it got to some place around here, and they shelved it. Um, but they went back later and found that it had this interesting side effect. And if you know anything about drug development, if you like, got to test very carefully, of course. So when you 
test the heart medication, you basically test it pretty much on middle-aged men who have that tend to have heart conditions, and you tend to have nurses, which are tend to be honestly young women that are doing exams, and they wrote down the side effect, which was spontaneous erection. Um, you know, it wasn't what they were aiming for, but they went back later on and found that that actually turned out to be a much more interesting effect of the drug, and that little blue pill came out through that side arrow and made lots of couples very happy and made lots of shareholders very happy. But that wasn't what they were aiming for, so it was really a remarkable innovation that they would then went back and put a whole process around to say, how do I go look for those kinds of side effects or things that I didn't really expect? And these are just a couple of um, interesting lessons learned about innovation and how to really drive it. You know, so yes, if you're going to run at scale, you've got to run great businesses and they've got to work at scale and be really good, but you have to take time to look around. And, and so those were a couple of examples of looking around and getting some really great things out of them. And I also find that in, in a large company where you get really focused on your day to day, it's actually really hard to make space and time and energy and money and talent for innovation. So I want to tell you the story about some of the things that we're doing at MasterCard to try and take on that one about making space for innovation. Because at the end of the day, the business that you're in changes radically. You guys know that all the time, but we see it all the time in our business. And so, for instance, today at, at MasterCard, um, we have rapid changes going on. I mean, you might picture a piece of plastic and say, that's the business. But we don't see it that way at all. Our business is, is entirely different than that. The, the places where people shop and how they shop and the expectations that they have about information and um, shopping experience so that you can before, during, and after that experience is completely different than it was just a few years ago. And our expectation is to be wildly different over the next few years. There's tremendous changes in things going on, for instance, in the way payments happen. Cash is dying, thank goodness. I'll tell you a little story about something that we're doing in South Africa um, that has a really tremendous impact, not just on our business, but on people's daily lives. And that's a really scalable thing, but it's really based on some really cool fundamental innovation. So these are just some of the things that we see happening in our world. And the only way to survive in this space is you, you, you can't just say, I'm going to be bigger and better and do what I did yesterday and be really great at that. You have to innovate. So with that in mind, we said, well, what does it really take to do that? Part of what it takes to do that is people who are solely dedicated to being champions of innovation. You can do it sort of along with your day job, but you actually need people that are good at it, that have skills and technique and passion for doing this that can bring people along. So we built out a thing called MasterCard Labs with a, with a man who just go do stuff, take risks, and try things. And as long as you failed smart, that was okay. The one thing you can't do is do it the way we were doing it before, which was spend a lot of time and a lot of money to get to the point where you discover that you failed. So um, I want to share with you just a, a few of the things that um, our team at Labs does in order to drive innovation in MasterCard. So if you think sort of back to this idea about how do you do, what's the product life cycle look like? And you sort of start with ideas, you go through a series of prototypes, and hopefully commercialize that thing. Um, that's the basic story. It kind of doesn't matter what you're making. Um, we follow that day to day, but what we do is we kind of added some innovation processes around that. So for instance, Aspire is a uh, crowdsourcing tool that we use for ideation, so people can throw out challenges to the 8,000 people at MasterCard, or we use it together with our customers so that groups, extended groups of people or universities can rally around an idea and create a, a bunch of different things. Um, we found that uh, we had a lot of great ideas, but then once we had those ideas, they got stuck in the machine. And we were back to it. it's taking two years to go from an idea to a business case, to research, to prototyping, to going back and writing a business plan, bringing that before an investment committee. And by the time you get all through that, you look at when you had the idea and when you're getting to market, and you know, 48 you know, years later, you're still not there. It's really frustrating. So we wanted to say, how could we radically accelerate that prototyping phase? And if we come up with something that's really great, great, let's go commercialize that. But if we fail, let's fail fast and go back and start over again. 
So there's a bunch more stuff like that, but let me just share with you um, two of those examples. Aspire, which is the, uh, the crowdsourcing idea um, for uh, really uh, early stage ideation and, uh, and then Innovation Express. So um, we had a bunch of components of technology that were sitting around. We had e-commerce, really easy stand-up way to do shopping, um, 3D barcodes, uh, and some interesting ways to embed those into apps. Um, and we had that as a package and a couple of ways to go use it, but what we didn't have was like the killer use case, and what we didn't have was a name for it. So we used Aspire to ask 8,000 people, what would you do with this and what would you call that? And in a very short period of time, we came up with uh, Quicker, because it was a quicker way to shop and do things. Um, and then a bunch of use cases, and, and I, I'll, I'll spare you the videos of the, of the schools in Australia that are now going uh, cashless with this thing, but it's kind of neat. Um, the next one is uh, Innovation Express, and um, this one's a little bit more intense, um, but it's been really fun for us, and some of the things that have come out of it have turned out to be quite fantastic. So this is the basic idea of saying, okay, you have an idea, you have an idea that you actually really like, how do you actually take that and bring that to life in a really short period of time? So we take uh, teams of developers and designers uh, and production people with business people. And we put together teams of them around a particular theme. And uh, we've done this in a bunch of cities around the world on different themes, which basically stand up teams and say, in 48 hours, develop a prototype, a business case, your elevator pitch, and show me. So really, you know, basically come in and do your VC pitch in 48 hours. And it can be for surprises. So, you know, we get, we get a chance to go get out of your day job and go do this. We've done it in New Delhi. We've done it in Reykjavik, Iceland. We did it in Miami. Um, we did one in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we're taking people from all over the world and putting them in some interesting places and, and having them focus on some things that they do every day for a living some things that are completely different than what they do every day for a living, but with this infrastructure and process that actually makes it easy to produce some really cool results in a short period of time. So um, let me show you what sort of Innovation Express looks like. How do you go from concept to prototype in 48 hours? Collaboration and competition. Start with the seeds of four innovative ideas. Build four cross-functional teams Put each team in a room and give them 48 hours to grow those seeds into functioning prototypes, demonstration videos, and business plans. MasterCard has put this idea to practice at events around the world for a variety of business opportunities. We bring together teams of developers, designers, and business people to compete to create new solutions. Promising concepts come out of targeted ideation sessions involving MasterCard staff from across the organization. Participants consider the value to their target markets, to MasterCard, and to our partners. Here's what the 48 hours look like. based on business value, creativity, and technology accomplishment. And members of the winning teams receive iPads and MasterCard prepaid gift cards. Yeah, I think Jenna can be a problem. Mm -hmm. This application has so many users, they won't get to leave the country. And if this becomes so commercial, I would like to tell my grandkids that I was going to do Several projects are in market or on the path to commercialization. Innovation Express is a proven catalyst for delivering real solutions for real business opportunities and then getting them to market fast. So it's been really fun for a lot of people at MasterCard to participate in those things and we've got some great ideas to prototype stages very quickly and been able to make good decisions, we think, about commercializing those things. The other thing that it's done is it has created a whole passion for innovation. You saw a couple of people up there um, talking about their experiences. You know, when you get somebody, so that was a woman that works with us in Istanbul. But that passion of saying, you know, I hope to be able to tell my grandchildren that I did this, is um, not something that you normally get in your everyday life in a 
big company environment. So to be able to sort of create that passion for innovation, to make you want it so bad that you're going to go do it again, that you're going to run that gauntlet of dealing with the, all the everyday stuff they have to do in order to go find space to do that, has really been building, um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, there's others of these that we've done in partnership with small companies. Um, this is a, a picture of the story of uh, Alsace, the South African Social Security Agency. Uh, so, has anyone here been to South Africa? So, if you've been there and if you've visited the townships and you've sort of seen the country, it's, it's a magnificent country, but it's really dire poor. Um, and in South Africa, 20% of the people receive weekly distributions of uh, benefits from the government uh, every week. And they were receiving those in cash. So picture that once a week, basically a big chunk of the country comes to a standstill. And there's trucks, armored trucks, rolling throughout the country. People lining up from 3 o'clock in the morning, standing in the town square, <coughs> waiting to get their cash. Um, so you can imagine that that's really unproductive. It's actually very dangerous. Uh, because, you know, there's lots of places, frankly, if you, if you go around the world and you look at the correlation between sort of what's your uh, life environment like and uh, how much money do you have, they tend to correlate pretty well. That a lot of the poorest places in the world are, a lot of, are often the most dangerous places in the world. And if you're walking around with all the money that you have in cash in your pocket, you often get robbed uh, and you lose that money. So cash turns out to be really expensive and a really bad solution for the people who need the most help. And so we created this little registration suitcase and went around at uh, these town squares and churches at all kinds of places and registered people with their fingerprints and their voice prints. So there were some other problems as well with that cash distribution system. Things like the fact that um, there was a whole cottage industry of people that would line up in one township and get money and then go to another township, and they line up there as somebody else and get money, and then go to a third, and they line up and they get paid there. And the whole thing was paper-based, so it was kind of impossible to tell who was who. There were people that were dead for 20 years that were still collecting their money and things like that. So it was very inefficient. Um, there was also a lot of money that never got to the people intended whatsoever, because those suitcases full of cash would often just disappear. So people would line up and wait, you know, from 3 o'clock in the morning, and then the person would get there and say, sorry, I don't want so those people not only don't have the money and somebody that shouldn't have it does, but they literally have no money for food that week uh, as well. So doing this electronic makes a huge difference to those people. So say the South African government a lot just in basic operational costs. They went from about three and a half dollars a person per week that distributed that money to about a buck a week. Uh, it's, a, it's on a card. And the money is done electronically and the person can, doesn't have to go stand in line and, they're working, take a day off from their job to go get money. Um, and because it's biometric, you can um, do it over any telephone to do your voice print, or you can go to one of those same registration stations that we still have distributed around, and you can do it with your fingerprint, um, and automatically reload your car. Um, so that's been really cool, and the uh, people in South Africa have become really passionate about their car. Now, most of these people don't have a bank account. So they no longer have to walk around with uh, their entire um, uh, worldly possessions in cash in their pocket at risk, frankly, of, of losing it or being robbed. They're walking around with a card in their pocket, and if that card is lost or stolen, then the balance that was on the card is just replaced. Same as you or I would if we lost our debit card or credit card. So it's really been transformational for the people um, uh, as individuals. But we've also found that it's been transformational for businesses. Um, people there, um, like many of us, right, were shopping at their local stores. But their local stores didn't really have a lot of competition, and so those people were paying disproportionately high prices for goods. With that card, they can now obviously shop online, um, and it gives them a way to travel someplace else and, uh, and, and shop as well. So their, their price for goods and services has actually come down, and the number of merchants that are actually taking card now, going electronic, has gone up dramatically. 
So it's really created an ecosystem of electronic payments where there wasn't one before, and one that's gone from financial exclusion to financial inclusion. Turns out that's a really big problem in many places in the world, and now doing a similar kind of program in Nigeria, um, where we expect to get about 80 million people to go through and do that same kind of registration process. We're doing one in India that's got some similar characteristics to it. So there's times where you can do innovation, and this was a, at the time this was a small company that had this idea together with us and the government to go try this in one place like South Africa and get an uptake on an idea that can really be dramatic. But I don't have to tell you guys that because that's sort of the whole idea of a startup, right, is come up with one great idea and get it to work at scale. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about innovation, but also seeking innovation, seeking innovation from small companies. But it's really hard as a, a small business to work with a large one, and we recognize that. And even fundamental things like just finding who to talk to can be challenging. So one thing that we've uh, added recently has been a uh, process to engage with startups, uh, both for us to be a more integral part of the startup community, but also to make it easy for people to find MasterCard and do things together with us. So we added up a couple of things. One was um, working with uh, companies like uh, Techstars and um, Startup Bootcamp, just as a way to take people that are really at the early stages of idea and create infrastructure that allows them to do startup company. The other is working with Silicon Valley Bank, who's one of the best banks in the country, actually, at, at banking startups and entrepreneurs, um, working together with them to create uh, accelerators, so sort of like uh, VC accelerator kind of companies. We're doing uh, a few of those, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, and uh, one in Dublin. So that's kind of the story about what's going on uh, at MasterCard, a little bit of my personal history about trying to drive innovation in a large company environment. Maybe a little bit different from yours, but would love to get your point of view about um, what does this sound like to you and uh, what's interesting that we could go do together. Uh, and I think we're doing it right now. I had a question about the 48 hour uh, sprints. Yeah. Uh, curious, one, if you ever open that up to third parties, trusted vendors, and the public. And then, two, curious uh, about the investment in the infrastructure to support. Such a hackathon, a business yeah. hackathon, like you need a robust guide and good data for those to be successful. So I'm curious if you're uh... um, so there's a couple of questions in there. One is that we've done it outside of MasterCard and the other is infrastructure to make it work. Uh, so yeah, we, we started doing it with just ourselves to kind of develop our technique and, and sort of what do you need to make it work. Um, but we've done it with customers, we've done it, so we've done it with banks, we've done it with uh, large merchants, and we've done it at university, we did one recently at um, that's, that's And they're really interesting, and they're really different when you do it that way, because when you do it with sort of home MasterCard people, you know, as much as you try and get out of the box, you know, you're, you're really starting with a preset uh, idea and, and modeling. And when, you, and you, when you find that when we do it with different groups, that uh, the, the starting point for the idea is radically different, and so it's been really fun. Um, in terms of the, 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 the infrastructure, we've been also building that up a lot. Um, the thing that makes this work uh, is the fact that there are some really special people that we pull together that have um, actually special purpose infrastructure. They're, they're actually wizards at prototyping, they can literally. Um, so it's a combination of uh, design engineers and people that have great graphic prototyping skills and tools um, and large supplies of free coffee and red bull kind of energy uh, you can imagine. Because in that 48 hours, it's not a lot of sleep. Um, but people said it really energized about the whole thing. Um, we've also done, uh, a lot of our stuff is data-based, um, and there's a lot of data mining things that go on. So we've really created a private sandbox of data and tools and analytics that they can pull on so that they can uh, do a lot of these things without having sort of those four pieces to start with. But it, it's a great question, because the, the tools and the people and the process that we had in the beginning is very different than the kit that we have now. I think uh, elaborate on the post 48 hour process between the end of that moment and getting 
the market. Because I've seen very similar things at other companies where they go and make massive amounts of progress in two days, and the idea is like, thank you for the market. Honestly, I, I've been a sponsor for a bunch of these things, um, and I've seen lots of others. Um, I had a slide that my lawyers won't let me put it up, but, um, but it shows a whole slew of really cool logos that are sort of the, 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 the place marks for what happened after those 48 hours. Um, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of those were interesting, but really not scalable ideas. But there are a few there that actually are scalable. And what's happened with them is some of them get picked up by me or my colleagues that run businesses at MasterCard and say, wow, I'd really like to go do that. And so it becomes part of our VAU kind of thing. Some of those teams we actually put into next stages where we've done uh, incubators for uh, taking interesting ideas that we've demonstrated with these prototypes and trying to run them at scale. So we did one which was a, um, so the basic idea was uh, it's great to make offers to people at a shop, but it's a lot more compelling if your buddy tells you about that offer and says this is a great deal. So sort of combine that thing of contextual offers with social and um, doing that in the community. So we did that in, uh, we actually took one of those and put that into a different kind of a, an incubator process that we did in Toronto, Canada, um, centered on uh, one of the universities in Toronto and with a bunch of shops uh, in, in the local community to sort of see, gee, does this work at scale? within a, a, you know, a little environment, and then if so, can you really take that and, and do that in the large? And it was interesting, but it turned out that there was a bunch of things that didn't work about it, and frankly, we didn't see when we did the prototype, and if we hadn't gone and spent three months in Toronto, we'd never figured out. But quite frankly, we could have spent three years thinking this was the greatest thing ever, spent a bunch of time, energy, and money going and doing it, and I think we would have gotten the same result, which is, if your flight doesn't work, we you really get it out into the community at large. So we're, we're trying to take, uh, do more with just, more than just get sort of cool prototypes at the end of 48 hours. And we really do see that we need more on that commercialization side. Um, and in fact, I think that's still work in progress. What was the time length between that and getting that pilot program running? Oh, that one, it was about, uh, it was also about three months. So the, that, that team came out of one in Miami and um, it was really, it was kind of neat because it was, it was actually one of the people on the team said, this is really good. I don't want to go back to my day job. I actually want to go do this. Uh, and the woman that uh, runs our business in Canada said, great, I'll be a sponsor. And they will hook them up in Toronto with a, a merchant community and a university and sort of stuff like that. So we use that as, as energy. Of, you know, are those the elements that you actually need to go do a commercial station? Learn a little bit more out of it, but it, you know, I don't think that anybody has the perfect answer for how to go do that. So if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, like moving towards a cashless society, um, what are your, your opinions and thoughts on something like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and services like blockchain? Um, I think they're really interesting. Um, I think, frankly, the reality is that currency in any way, shape, or form, has always been a substitute for the exchange of real goods or services. It's been an intermediary, it's been a placeholder um, since it was born. So the fact that you go from a paper-based currency to an electronic currency, from an electronic currency that's backed by the full faith and, and, and what's, the, what's the proper term for our U.S. currency? Sorry, I don't have this one saying that. But it's basically, you know, government-backed currencies. So, you know, the, there were a lot of issues with Bitcoin, but it's a great first experiment and there will certainly be more of that. Um, but it does bring up, it, it is a good example of what happens when you take an interesting idea and then you push it a little bit and then you start to run into the confines of the rest of the world. Things like, um, you know, there, there's, there's six letters that, that um, are really hard letters uh, in, in our world. KYC, AML. KYC stands for Know Your Customer, and AML stands for Anti-Money Laundering. And those are massive obligations by all the governments in the world that really try and um, make, provide transparency around money that's moving, whether it's moving 
paper or electronic. And, and so those obligations don't go away just because you go do digital link or, or anything else. So I think that's the other thing is that when you're doing innovative ideas, um, at some point they have to fit into the context of the rest of the world. And uh, we think that virtual currencies will be a big thing in And 
It's just a substitute for the exchange for a contract between people that are buying and selling goods and services. And it works a whole lot better in the electronic world where there's a lot less friction and there's a lot more creativity that you can do around that transaction. So 95% um, of the world's transactions today are still cash-based. So we think that being in the electronic payments business is a pretty cool business to but be in. do you in. think the cards themselves, like that's going to go away as well? And Cards are just a placeholder. The next thing Cards are just a vehicle, it's an access to an account. So the fact that you know you have a car, or you have your mobile phone, and you have a, a mechanism to access an account, it kind of doesn't matter. They're all just vehicles to tie two ends of the thing together, which is you got somebody that's selling something and they want a guarantee from somebody who's holding an account that I'll pay you for it. So whether that's a credit card or a debit card or a prepaid card, whether it's a physical piece of plastic, the max stripe or a chip, or whether it's embedded in the phone, and whether it communicates by SMS or other kinds of mechanisms using cryptography and biometrics and things like that, it just makes it better. But at the end of the day, it's really about that electronic transaction between two accounts that's the essence of the difference between cash money and electronic. And so that's why I think all that stuff around kind of gets interesting when you go electronic. You can do a whole lot more to create a great user experience than you can just cash. Yes? Um, so I, I ran an internal innovation lab my last company, and one of the things I realized is that you know, in order to really do it correctly, and, and you had to create almost a separate environment that was detached, um, not only even physically, but even from a brand, brand standpoint. Have you ever considered some kind of unbranded sort of EPO or I don't know, uh, kind of satellite lab that really had all the makings of proper design lab? Um, I've lived through a few iterations of these at some large companies. So labs, MasterCard Labs for us is, is one version of that. I will tell you previously at a bank that I was at, they had exactly the philosophy that you could never do this the bank basically had to go off to the side and spin off a whole new entity and a whole new company. And the problem with that, it's not that it's not, uh, that it doesn't relieve a lot of the tensions and, and restrictions of the, of the existing big company, but the problem with that is that you got smart people with money and ideas and they're standing alone. And um, that's all of you. That's a great vehicle. But what we lost access to was this gigantic business that's running over here. And the real magic is if you can take that innovation and ideation and pace and make it work in this scale environment when you're running a business in hundreds of countries and there's tons of people and, and real flow sure. every day, if you can make those two come together, then it's really, yeah. really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I'm mean, kind of implying that there's a pipeline that runs between them, but that the environment in which the innovation happening is the environment of those cash cows that are just on sort of in maintenance yeah. and, and incremental growth. No, I, I don't know. I certainly am not standing here saying that we have the perfect answer for that. Yeah. Um, but getting that combination, you're right, creating the sandbox in which you can safely play with new ideas and force yourself to think differently about the pace and who you get to talk about the ideas and how you work yeah. on them but still be able to bring them back right to the core business and change the way you work and, and then use those ideas yeah. and get the advantages of scale that you've built up over time. I think that's the, that's yeah. the magic that we're all looking for. It, it, it's sort of like people talk about core and edge and concept, and I guess maybe I'm suggesting that the edge could be a physical entity as well. Yeah. Huh? I'd love to talk to you more about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, anyway, maybe we have time for one last question. Not, thank you very much for coming out.